What's your opinion about the economic theory MMT, um, especially the United States, because it's the reserve currency for the world? Well, I think they're more. I think the modern monetary theorists are more confident than they ought to be, too. I don't think we, any of us, know what's going to happen with this stuff. I do think there's a good chance that that this extreme conduct is more feasible than everybody thought. But I do know if you keep just doing it without any limit, it will end in disaster. If you can borrow money at a guaranteed low or even zero interest rate, is it still worthy of borrowing money for not that guaranteed cost from the insurance operation? It reduces the value of float by a substantial amount. And <laughs> we have a flexibility with our float that virtually no one has. And I've written about this in the annual letter. Uh, uh, but the, uh, the value of float has gone down dramatically because uh, uh, everything, is, everything is off of interest rates. And when you get to negative interest rates, uh, if a country can borrow at negative interest rates, you get into something that's kind of akin to the St. Petersburg paradox. And those of you who want to go to search, you can find some interesting things on it. But it becomes infinite. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a crazy uh, consequence of a bunch of abstract mathematics that, where you get there. But, but you, you, lo you lose gravity entirely. Uh, and, you know, if you tell me that, that, that I'm going to have to lend money to the government at minus 2% a year, and I'm talking nominal figures, not, you know, you're just telling me how I'll go broke over time. <laughs> if, I, if I do that, so it pushes you to do other things. And, of course, we've seen it. Well, we saw the rest of the world do it in an even more extreme fashion, but nobody, Paul Samuelson, brilliant man, nobody, nobody thought you could do this, and, and we don't really know what the consequences are. But we know there are consequences, obviously. <clears throat> what impact does the rise of so many new SPACs have on Berkshire's ability to find and close new acquisitions? Well, it's, it's a killer. Uh, uh, the SPACs generally have to spend their money in two years, as I understand it. So they have to buy a business in two years. If you put a gun to my head and said, you got to buy a big business in two years, you know, I'd buy one, but <laughs> it wouldn't be much of one. Uh, uh, it, you know, we look and look, and, and, and now there are, I don't know how many, whether it's hundreds, and there's always been the pressure from private equity funds. I mean, if you're running money for somebody else and you're getting paid a fee and you get the upside and, and you don't have the downside, you're going to buy something. And uh, 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 I, I could tell you, but I, I, I had a very famous, I had a call from a very famous figure many years ago that was involved in it and wanted to learn about reinsurance. And I said, well, I don't really think it's a very good business. And he said, yeah, he says, if I don't spend this money in six months, I've got to give it back to the investors. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's a different equation that you have if you're working with other people's money where you get the upside and you have to give it back to them if you don't do something. <laughs> and frankly, we're not competitive with that. You know, and that won't go on forever, but uh, it's where the money is now and Wall Street goes where the money is. And it, it, it does anything, you know, basically that, that works. And SPACs have been working for a while and you stick your, a famous name on it, you can, you can sell almost anything. And it, it's, it's, but it's, it's, not, it's an exaggerated version of what we've seen in, in kind of gambling done type market. In fact, I, I did have a quote from Kane. Uh, this, is, this is probably the most famous, one of the most famous quotes in, in history because it really sums up the problem of the fact we've got the greatest markets the world could ever imagine. I mean, imagine being able to own parts of the biggest businesses in the world and putting billions of dollars in them and take it out of, you know, two days later. I mean, compared to farms or apartment houses or office buildings where it takes months to close a deal, I mean, the markets offer a chance to participate and invest in earning assets on a basis that's very, very low cost and instantaneous, huge, all kinds of good things. But it makes its real money if they can get, get the gamblers to come in because they, get, they provide more action and they're willing to pay sillier fees and all kinds of things. So you have this incredible, uh, huge 
asset to you, humanity, but it's, it really makes its money when people are doing stu stupid things. I mean, that's where the money really is. And Keynes wrote this in 1930, in 1936, it says 1939 on the slide, but he wrote in 1936 in the general theory that you know, speculators may do no, no harm as bubbles on a steady stream of enterprise. But the position is serious when enterprise becomes the bubble on a whirlpool of speculation. When the capital development of a country becomes a byproduct of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done. Well, the stock market, we've had a lot of people into the casino in the last year. You have millions and billions of people who have set up accounts where they day trade, where, they, where they're selling puts and calls, where they, uh, I would say that you had the greatest increase in the number of gamblers, essentially, but, and there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with gambling, and they, a, they got better odds than they've got if they played the lottery, but they've, they've had cash in their pocket, they've had action, and they actually had, you know, have a lot of results, and, and if they just bought stocks, they do fine and held them, but, but the, the gambling impulse is very strong, and people work. worldwide and occasionally it gets an enormous shove uh, and uh, and conditions lead to this place where more people are entering the casino than are leaving every day and it creates its own reality for a while and nobody tells you when the clock's going to strike 12 and it all turns to pumpkins and mice but uh, uh, the the when the competition is playing with other people's money, or whether they're, and if they're playing foolishly with their own money, but they, the big stuff is done with other people's money, <laughs> uh, they're going to beat us. I mean, and, uh, 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 we're not, we're not. Uh, that's a different game, and they've got more. They've got a lot of money, so we're not going to have much luck on, on acquisitions, uh, uh, while this sort of a period continues, but it's happened before. This is about as extreme as we've seen it, isn't it, Charlie? Or? Yes, of course. I call it fee-driven buy. In other words, not buying because it's a good investment. They're buying it because the advisor gets paid. And of course, the more of that you get, the sillier your civilization is getting. And to some extent, it's a moral failure, too because the easy money made by things like SPACs and total derivatives, return derivatives and so on and so on. You push that to excess, it causes horrible problems for civilization. It reflects no credit on the people who are doing it and no credit on the regulators and voters that allow it. So I, I think we have a lot to be ashamed of in current conditions. But it's where the money is. Yeah, but we still have, but it's shameful what's going on. It's not just stupid, it's shame. It's not just It's not I don't regard it as shameful on a lot of the people that gamble. I mean, it, 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 uh, gambling is a very human instinct, and they've got money in their pocket, and they know somebody else has made money who they don't think is any smarter than they are. And, no, no, I, I don't mind the poor fish that gamble. I don't like the professionals that... Take the suckers. This is so we just heard Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger speak to really three topics, if you think about it. So I'll do a recap of all three. One, MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Number two, Insurance Float. And number three, um, SPACs. So with regards to the first one, Insurance Float, or sorry, rather MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, basically this is where governments around the world can basically do whatever they want. There's no financial constraint on government spending, right? As long as a country is a sovereign issuer of currency and doesn't tie the value to another currency. So that's pretty dangerous because that means the government can just create money and print money and just and just do whatever they want. And that's kind of why we're seeing this total hyperinflation scenario because why not just solve all our problems by just printing a bunch of money, right? Why bother, you know, doing things in a
fiscally responsible manner. Let's just let's just do the easy way, right? It's like your kid asking you to buy a toy, and the easy way is just keep buying them toys so that the problem goes away. But you're just pour, you're kicking the can down the road. So the problem with this modern monetary theory is that, as they alluded to, it, it can go hyper. And you're going to see a lot of money fighting the system, which we're seeing now. So, you know, this will ultimately lead to savers being losers or people who can't keep up with inflation, which means that most people in the poor class, the lower class, the working class, and the middle class, and perhaps even the upper middle class will be, you know, punished. And really only the people who are the upper class and the elites and the wealthy will stand to benefit from this policy so ultimately mmt is going to hurt the majority of people and only benefit a small minority so that's the issue with mmt here so i agree with um warren and charlie that the unchecked this will lead to devastation for society because the majority of people are suffering and are continuing to suffering because our wages aren't keeping up with the inflation rate <coughs> Number two, with regards to insurance flow and kind of tying in with number one with MMT is what happens to the value of insurance flow. Well, you know, insurance flow actually basically, you know, does lose its value as Warren Buffett alludes to because, you know, your other people are able to borrow money or issue equity so easily that your float on hand doesn't have the same kind of buying power that it once did, right? It's, again, it's saving money instead of, you know, while there's a lot of money being printed, so you really should be spending it. So, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, as of November 2021, has a record 150 billion US dollars in cash, which honestly should probably only be 50 billion because they really should spend about 100 billion of it towards probably large cap US equities at this point. Um, just based on their position as well as, you know, the amount of money that is. So by holding it, they do lose the value there and the ability to um, purchase minority stakes, substantial stakes, majority stakes, or wholly acquired businesses. And that kind of leads to the third point in this SPAC environment. These companies are able to, you know, go, you know, to the market without needing any kind of financial backing by these larger firms like a Berkshire or, you know, a SoftBank. So they can kind of do this on their own and in this easy money period, as well as the gambling instinct of, you know, the new generation, the millennial generation that's has been in the workforce for a number of years now and kind of has some savings to work with. This is the effect that we see for every generation that's now playing out the millennials. So you know, we've seen SPACs go up and go down rapidly because a lot of these companies aren't making money, may never make money, and in some cases aren't even making any sales and may never make any sales. So <clears throat> what that really leads to is, and I agree with what Charlie Munger said, the retail investors can go gambling if they want, but ultimately the onus should be on the regulators who should know better and protect the average investor from you know, being cheated, right, disillusioned, misled, or even straight up defrauded, as some of them have unfortunately turned out to be frauds. So, you know, where where someone's money is, their heart is also, and in this easy regulatory environment, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, very shady um, effects happen, and if you're not careful, you know, as they say, a fool and their money will soon be parted, and we're kind of seeing that happen in 2021 with not just people getting suckered into SPACs, but just the insane options market that people are playing in now. You've got people buying and selling somehow, you know, naked puts and naked calls or even combinations of naked options. And the potential <clears throat> devastation we see from there, again, we see that young American who committed suicide, he thought he lost 750 thousand quarter of a million but it turned out to be just a fraction of that an error right by uh robin hood but you know he ended up taking his life so we want to you know be fiscally responsible and avoid 
as Charlie Munger would say, becoming animal-spirited and being suckered in by FOMO.